Hello, uh, Nate Oftley here. This is Ascent Anthropology. Last month, uh, on the 20th of August, 2022, I took a trip to Folsom, New Mexico, which is the site of the 1926 uh, Folsom Point Discovery. As we know now, uh, this site placed humans uh, in the Americas as long as 11,000 years ago, late Pleistocene age, uh, when previously it was thought that to be only about 3,000 years before present day. Uh, this timeline has been pushed back earlier, of course, um, to uh, uh, 14,000 years ago with the 1929 uh, Clovis Point discovery, also in New Mexico, uh, and more recently the footprints in uh, White Sands, New Mexico. Uh, I think that's dating us to around 23,000 years ago, and I think another recent discovery with mammoth bones which potentially show uh, signs of human tools um so i don't know about the date on that one i think that's still kind of under uh investigation um however the uh the fulsome point as uh we're going to discuss in this slideshow uh, is still considered to be the pinnacle of paleo indian uh tool making um compared to uh other other stone tool types Quick disclaimer here, uh, so I've referenced uh, various uh, different articles, uh, primary sources, secondhand stories regarding George McJunkin and the Folsom Man, and while I do my best to report on these findings as accurately as possible, um, if you find any discrepancies uh, in uh, this presentation, uh, if, it's, if there's anything inaccurate, just let me know. Uh, you can send me an email. Uh, at ascent.anthropology at gmail.com uh, but I hope I've done everything I can to uh, portray George as true the original uh, as as it could be depending on where you look there are a few discrepancies um, like whether or not George found uh, the Folsom point or just the bones and we know now it was he, he only found the fossilized bones uh, in wild horse or oil uh, and then also whether or not he was there for the gunfight um, and the arrest of the Ketchum gang. Uh, but we know actually he uh, he did uh, guide the uh, sheriff to the, the campsite where they were able to find the plans. But, but he, did, he wasn't actually in the gunfight. So it just kind of depends on, on where you look. Uh, but uh, George was absolutely uh, an American legend in his own right. So... Um, I hope you uh, enjoy the presentation. So the agenda for this presentation is uh, we're going to talk about George McJunkin. Also, um, we'll, we'll look at Folsom, New Mexico and the museum there in Folsom. Um, we'll look at the Folsom Man site and then we'll talk about Bison Antiquus and then finally finish up with the Folsom Point. So here's George, uh, George McJunkin. He was born in 1851, uh, most likely. Um, I think you can narrow it down to that date. Uh, the Civil War, of course, uh, although he was only a teenager at the time, uh, Civil War played a pivotal role in, uh, in George's life uh, and his, his future as a frontiersman and cowboy. Some say it was the Civil War and that fight for freedom that really inspired George and uh, inspired his love of nature and, and just his free spiritedness. He was born into slavery uh, again around 1851. His owner, John Sanders McJunkin, uh, who he took his name, his last name from, uh, well, uh, John Sanders McJunkin, he owned a ranch where uh, from a very young age, George learned how to ride and, uh, and rustle cattle from uh, his fellow or from his from Mexican vaqueros who also worked on the ranch. George's father was a blacksmith, also of course a slave, uh, but he did he worked saved enough to be able to actually buy back his own freedom uh, previous to the Civil War. Uh, George was actually he found his freedom after the Emancipation Proclamation. And that was kind of a turning point in George's life. Uh, that's when he decided to follow his dreams of moving west, becoming a cowboy. Um, that was in 1867. 
he uh, decided to move out to New Mexico territory, and he eventually took over the Crowfoot Ranch as trail boss there. He was uh, bilingual, um, learned to speak Spanish from his Mexican compadres. He also uh, was known as like an expert bronco buster, um, and he would often trade riding lessons for reading lessons. Uh, he also loved to play fiddle. Um, and uh, uh, at one point, uh, when uh, when George was out on the trail, he came across a U.S. Cavalry uh, lieutenant who had been wounded and robbed by bandits. Uh, so, but George was there uh, and actually was able to save his life. And in return, uh, this lieutenant gave George um, a telescope. And uh, this is uh, what we think fostered uh, George's love for the stars and space and astronomy. Uh, but most of all, George was fascinated by nature and the world around him. He collected rocks, fossils, crystals, um, and uh, when he discovered the site, he tried for a very long time to get everybody, you know, to get his friends to go out there and, and check out these gigantic bones. Uh, but he was only ever to get a couple of his friends, uh, Carl Schwaheim, to go out there with him. Um, and... Uh, uh, sadly, uh, so he would never really be recognized uh, for the discovery of the Folsom Man site uh, until after his death uh, in 1922. But he did pass away peacefully uh, in the Folsom Hotel among friends. And the Folsom Hotel is, um, you can see right here, I'm pretty sure that's where he lived for a time of his life as well. Uh, so Folsom today... It has a population of about 50, um, and you can't call it a ghost town. This, it's, um, it's. Uh, I mean, there's not very many people who live there, but everybody who does, they love it, uh, especially the people who work at the museum. Um, it's got a rich and fascinating history. It's about 60 miles southeast of Trinidad, Colorado, uh, and uh, previous to European settlement, it was hunting grounds for hundreds and hundreds of years for the Comanche the Ute and uh, Hikaria Apache nations. In the 1880s, uh, the railroad, the Colorado and Southern Railroad, uh, put Folsom on the map as a stopping point for miners and other settlers moving west. And there's a close correlation. It's not on the Santa Fe Trail, but it still played a, a, a role in, in the establishment of that moving towards Santa Fe. Um, and so uh, with the train, uh, along comes train robbers. You got the wild bunch here with, uh, you know, uh, Butch Cassidy and Sundance and the Sundance kid. You have the Ketchum gang. Uh, so two of the most notorious uh, cowboy train robbing gangs in New Mexico at the time. Um, George actually did. He helped in the arrest of, of the Ketchum gang. Uh, so he, one evening, they crossed paths and they actually sat around the same fire and ate dinner together. Uh, but George just, uh, it just didn't seem right. He didn't get the right uh, feeling from, from this group. So the following day, he uh, reported the location to Sheriff Titsworth. And uh, so when they went out to the campsite, they recovered these, the, these paper plans that included their hideout in uh, Cimarron. And so, but... So this ended up in a gunfight uh, at their hideout and eventually their surrender. Um, and this was after three years of robbing trains and they actually made off with quite a bit of money. Uh, Black Jack Ketchum, uh, who you can see here. Uh, really. Yeah, that's this guy right there. But um, he was kind of the brains of the, of the, of the gang. Uh, and uh, he was actually hung there in Folsom, New Mexico. But there was some miscalculation or uh, mismeasurement there with the gallows and his weight and, and the weight of, of uh, the sand. But uh, he actually lost his head, like literally in the process. Um, so basically, they hung him, his head stopped, and the rest of his body just kept going. And so the bottom right here, uh, I mean, it's not too graphic, but you can see uh, I think that's his head there. And this is after he had actually had his left arm, I believe, uh, shot 
off almost by the train conductor with a shotgun. So just his arm was just kind of dangling there. So, you know, he, uh, he was, uh, in quite a bit of trouble on his way out. Um, yeah, he pretty much just gave up at that point. So this was Folsom, New Mexico at the turn of the century you know, in the 19th century. Uh, the Folsom Museum, uh, which you can see here. Um, and so the, the event that kind of uh, launched uh, George into the history books uh, was a flood. In August 1908, there was a, a once in a lifetime flood that actually killed 19 people in Folsom. But uh, obviously George survived after the flood. Uh, George went out uh, across Crowfoot Ranch, uh, probably looking for, for lost cattle and repairing fence, you know, fence posts and different things, different damage from the flood. Um, and while he was crossing Wild Horse Arroyo, he, uh, he noticed um, uh, some bones that were poking out from, from the washed out bank. And as a rancher and cowboy, uh, George, he knew, he knew cow bones and he knew bison bones and, but he had never seen anything like this. These, these were way bigger, just gigantic in comparison to the, you know, modern day bison that, that he'd seen. Um, and again, yeah, so he, he knew he had found something really unique at that point. And he tried to get, uh, paleontologists out there and scientists and archeologists out there. And they never really went out there and until four years after his death. But um, later on, now what we know is they've discovered 32 fossilized bison antiquus bones. Uh, they were all discarded there after a hunt. Uh, there could be more. Uh, we've not gotten to the full extent of the site yet. Um, some of these bones are on display at the Folsom Museum, uh, but most of them um, are in Denver at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. So again, the Folsom Museum here, this is it pretty much, I don't know uh, the date of this, uh, but it's, it looks pretty much like that today. Um, it's a great little, great little uh, museum, I guess. Um, they also have a gift store and you can buy books there and stuff. Uh, inside you'll find books, maps, taxidermy, uh, old newspaper articles, photographs, rocks, and, and artifacts from the Folsom area. Um, it is also the center of different events like marathons up to the Capitan Volcano and barbecues of which they did serve to us that day. Um, it was great, great. Uh, they made us burgers. They weren't bison burgers, but they were really great burgers. Um, that was really nice to be able to eat as soon as we got back from the site. Um, and of course, um, it was the starting point for our, our site visit to the Folsom site, right? So. This is us getting our, our brief here. Uh, we kind of convoyed out there. We had to go off road, um, so I got to take my Jeep out there. So that was pretty sweet. It was about a 20 to 30 minute drive um, off road to get to the actual Folsom Man site. They only do this a couple times a year. It is state land managed by the state land office. Again, uh, so George was not initially recognized uh, for the discovery and the dig didn't take place until four years after his death in 1926. This was started by some of his friends, though. Um, they were also like fellow uh, nature enthusiasts and fossil and, and rock collectors. But so one of them was uh, uh, probably his closest friend, I think, was this blacksmith named Carl Schwaheim. And that's him right here. And he's pointing out the location of, uh, I think, the second or third point that they found uh he's a uh, point is this is this photo is from 1927 and this is paleontologist barnum brown um and the first point that they found they actually pulled out of the ground and so didn't have any integrity there's no way to really authenticate its uh you know its authenticity right so uh but uh after that um it was um jd figgins and harold cook that uh, kind of gave instructions like hey next time you find a point leave it in context so we can assess it prop properly right so um throughout the excavation there was a total of 26 uh, spear points uh that they ended up finding um they were discarded amongst the bones um embedded the they uh 
And then the, these, these spear points were uh, in situ, uh, embedded between the ribs, right? 